Welcome again to our service. Let's begin by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say together, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, 
but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for the, ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I want to speak this morning on a subject that I think some of us may be wrestling with now or perhaps have wrestled with in the past. How do we live after a revival? In previous years, St. Hilda's was uh, known far and wide as a center of the charismatic renewal in this part of our country, and we still continue very confidently in the charismatic scream. The charismatic movement is by no means gone or finished. But the fact is that the activity of the charismatic revival has passed its peak. We pray for another peak, but at least for now, we are living in a post-peak time. So an important question for us is, how do we live in a time like this? How do we be faithful to our Lord after the peak of a revival? Well, I want to begin by sharing a story about a great work of the Holy Spirit. Once, a missionary church planter traveled to a large city in Asia where the name of Christ was not known, and he preached the good news there in the hopes of starting a church. The response was both fast and strong. People converted, were baptized, and right away started speaking in tongues. Lots of public miracles happened, and many were healed from illnesses that they had. The people of this 
So they were so amazed at what happened that they that they abandoned their old religion and decided that they would give their allegiance and their life to Jesus Christ. Before long, this missionary had a thriving church to look after. Do you recognize this story? Is it a is it a missionary adventure of Hudson Taylor or perhaps William Carey? Well, it does sound something like that, but what I have described to you is actually the mission of the Apostle Paul to the city of Ephesus and Western Asia. Excuse me. In the book of Acts, we read the amazing story of the Holy Spirit working through Paul to draw people to saving faith in the Lord. We read about people speaking in tongues and being miraculously healed through a mere piece of clothing that had touched the Apostle. This was indeed a great work of the Holy Spirit. Then we read Paul's first letter to Timothy. By this point, Paul has moved on from Ephesus to work in other places. He, and he has left his protege, Timothy, behind to help instruct the Ephesian church in this new era. We don't know a lot about what was happening in the Ephesian church at this time, but from Paul's letter, it sounds like the initial surge is behind them. And what they're dealing with now is the question of how to set up the church for long-term success. For that reason, 1 Timothy is especially relevant for us as we carry on the Lord's work after the peak of the charismatic renewal. You, you might be pleased to to learn that we're not going to look in depth at all of 1 Timothy this morning, but we will have a close look at chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And here Paul starts off his instructions with a top priority. Timothy is to counter false teaching and uphold Christian love. The problem of false teaching is one that we need to zoom in on for a moment. False teaching very often emerges in conjunction with a genuine work of the Holy Spirit. It comes in many different forms, but you can be quite sure that some form of it will appear when a revival happens. In Paul's day in the city of Ephesus, it had something to do with myths and genealogies. Much later in the 1700s, there was something called the First Great Awakening, which was a huge revival movement in Britain and North America. Unfortunately, one of the main leaders of this revival started giving some strained teachings and went as far as to predict the date that Christ would come back, which was February 28, 1763. Obviously, it didn't happen. But in the end, there was a split in this revival. Now, what came after the first great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, which happened mainly in the United States. This revival led to a huge uh, surge of, of, of interest and activity in, among other places, upstate New York. And one of the many people who were captivated by this movement was a 12-year-old boy named Joseph Smith. You might have heard that name. But when he grew up, Joseph Smith founded the Mormon religion, which claims to be the restoration of the true Christian faith. His sensational message, which we know is wrong, sort of fit with the mood of that time. And in fact, some of his earliest converts were evangelical ministers. When the warmth of revival fire comes, the acrid smoke of false teaching will soon follow. Now, what is the false teaching that has followed the charismatic renewal? Well, as far as I can tell, the main one is what is often called the prosperity gospel, which says that having faith will necessarily make you healthy and wealthy. And to illustrate what this message looks like, I have pulled a direct quotation from a sermon that was made a number of years ago from a popular prosperity preacher. Note how it starts off reasonably well and then slides into false teaching. He's talking about God here. Quote, he can multiply your time and help you to get more done. He can multiply your wisdom and help you to make better decisions. He can multiply your finances and cause them to go further. 
This may sound kind of far out, but God can cause your car to get better gas mileage. He can cause you to stay out of those traffic jams. God can help you find the best deals at the store to find things that are on sale that are usually never on sale. End quote. This kind of mentality reduces God to a genie whose job it is to assist the consumer. This is false teaching. A number of years ago, I, I visited with a woman who was in the hospital with terminal cancer. She was reading a supposedly Christian book that had been given to her by a man that I had gone to church with for years. And this book was a prosperity gospel book that was saying, basically, that this woman or anyone with cancer could be healed if only they had enough faith. In other words, if you're dying of cancer, it's your own fault for not believing hard enough. False teaching has real consequences, and it is the responsibility of the church, and especially its leaders, to oppose it. Now, I don't think most of us at St. Hilda's are very tempted by this prosperity message, so I will leave it there and move on to the next part of Paul's instruction to Timothy. The knocking down of the false teaching is meant to lead to something positive, namely love. And this love flows like a stream coming from three different tributaries. And as I look around at the whole Christian church today, I'd be hard pressed to come up with three things that I think need to be heard more than the three things that Paul mentions here. So three tributaries, and we're going to have a look at all three of them. The first of them is a pure heart. The Old Testament often presents sin as being filth that clings onto something else, like the human heart. And, and this, this filth, this sin, needs to be removed from our hearts. And there's also a secondary aspect to it. In the Old Testament, purifying or cleansing is often linked with with consecration, with a thing being dedicated to God's use and therefore called holy. <clears throat> so to have a pure heart means to have a heart that is purged from the corruption of sin and dedicated entirely to the Lord and his purposes. Now, I want you to notice here that Paul is saying that you can, in fact, have a pure heart. The Old Testament scholar John Oswald has an illustration that fits in well here. There once was a man who saved up for years to go on his dream vacation, a week-long Caribbean cruise. Finally, he got enough money and got himself a luxury room on a beautiful ship. Only, he forgot to budget for the cost of food on that ship. So, when it came time for the cruise, he boarded with a trusty box of crackers. For the first six days, he spent all the meal times having plain crackers, and plain water in his room alone. But then, on the final day of, of this cruise, he thought he probably had enough money in his wallet to pay for one meal. So he had a walk on down to the dining hall and hope everything worked out. When he got there, he was shocked to find that there was a spot at a table with his name written on it. As it turned out, that, that spot had been reserved for him all week, because the food was included with the price of the cruise. A pure heart is like the food in this story. Many believers settle for crumbs, not realizing that the atoning death of Christ has purchased for them a spot at the finest table. We settle for small-time purification when the Lord offers us big-time purification. Paul says here that we can have a pure heart. Now, does that mean that we can get to a place where we reach absolute perfection and never sin whatsoever? Well, no, but neither is it right to say that the Christian life means sinning a little bit less than non-believers. The New Testament prescribes for us a consecration of our hearts to the Lord and a continual purging of sinful desires that leads to, and this is an important point, that leads to victory in our spiritual life. It is not a victory free of scrapes or cuts, 
but it is nevertheless a decisive victory. Okay, so we can have a pure heart, but how do we actually get one? Well, one thing that I um, enjoy doing sometimes is finding old uh, Billy Graham videos on YouTube. His evangelistic preaching was always very clear. God has provided salvation for you. You can't earn it yourself, but you need to accept it. You need to have faith. We can say something similar about purification. You can't make your heart pure on your own, but you can receive the purification that the Lord offers by trusting him, calling on him to purify your heart and choosing to walk in obedience to his word. So that's our first tributary, a pure heart. The second tributary that Paul mentions is what the English Standard Version calls a good conscience. This is one case where I think that the main translations, the ESV included, are not as good as they should be. We tend to think of our conscience as the voice in our head that tells us when, when we're about to do something wrong or maybe when it's too late and we've already done something wrong. What Paul mentions here is broader than that. The word that he uses refers to moral judgment. It's the ability to figure out the right thing to do. It's knowledge of right from wrong. So it's similar to our notion of a conscience, but it's not exactly the same. Moral judgment, which Paul talks about here, is like a road with a ditch on either side. We can go wrong in veering too far one way, and we can err in veering too far the other way. In previous generations, I think that evangelical Christians tended to go into the ditch of saying something was wrong when really it was totally fine. In one of my sermons in the summer, I talked about the idea that eating good-tasting food was a sin. Today, on the other hand, the tendency among evangelical Christians is to go the other way and to be lax about morality and say, you can do anything you want as long as it's not directly hurting somebody else. Both of these errors are the result of poor moral judgment. So how do we get the good moral judgment that Paul talks about here? Well, I'm going to give you one quick tip that will give you perfect moral judgment for the rest of your life. I hope that your eyebrows just went up. No, unfortunately, I can't do that. There is no simple rule that will solve all of your moral questions. However, there are things you can do to foster good moral judgment, and I will name a few of them. Of course, you must read scripture and see what the Lord has said to his people. But we must always be careful. I remember that once when I was in grade three, my teacher had the whole class close their eyes and sit in absolute silence for a prescribed period of time. I was quite proud to catch one of my fellow students sitting there with her eyes open, and I immediately called her out in front of the whole class. My teacher, however, quickly pointed out that I wouldn't know that unless I was breaking the rule myself. And not only that, I'd also broken the no talking rule. We can easily miss or just ignore how instructions apply to us. So when we study God's word, we must have a spirit of repentance and active, an active spiritual life so that we can see and also admit what is in front of our nose. And finally, we must have courage, the courage to follow the truth wherever it leads us, and the courage to make unpopular decisions. So that's our second tributary, a good moral judgment. And the third tributary that Paul mentions in this verse is a sincere faith. And what he's talking about here is a faith that is not hypocritical. It's not just a show. It is the real deal. If you have a sincere faith, you live in private, the faith you proclaim in public. You don't have to work to keep up a Christian persona. Your Christian character naturally comes through. Now, this does not mean that you never feel inner 
conflict or that you never miss the mark. These are simply realities that we all face. But in the midst of these realities, we can still exercise a genuine trust in our Lord and Savior. Now, how do we get a sincere faith and, and, and how do we avoid hypocrisy? Ultimately, it comes down once again to our choice, to our response to the Lord. The Holy Spirit offers us a life of true faith, just like he offers us a pure heart. And he gives us the choice as to whether we will say yes. Now, we need to understand that saying yes also means saying no to other things. I think that there are many people in the world who live with one foot in the church and one foot in the world of drunkenness and partying. Saying yes to sincere faith means saying goodbye to that wild party person. And that can be a very difficult decision. It can mean losing friends and other valued things as well. But as believers, we simply cannot, we cannot be divided in ourselves. We must be, devo be wholly devoted to the Lord. So we have three tributaries here, a pure heart, good moral judgment, and a sincere faith. All three of these tributaries are supposed to be a focus of the church in Ephesus after the great work of the Holy Spirit. We all like a good wedding, but the wedding does not happen for its own sake. Of course, the exciting wedding is supposed to lead into a long-lasting and fruitful marriage between the two people. Well, likewise, the work of the Holy Spirit is very exciting, but does not exist simply to be exciting. The idea is that it will lead to a long-lasting life of faith that has these three tributaries and many other great qualities as well. And, of course, all three tributaries combine to produce love. A purified heart, good moral reasoning, and sincere faith all allow us to love more, to love the right things, and to express that love in the right way. Let me close with these words. Do you have these three things? You might have been part of a wonderful revival, but have you been steadily growing in grace since that time? Do you clearly see all three tributaries in your life right now? Well, if the answer to that question isn't a resounding yes, I have very good news for you. The Lord offers you these things, and you can receive them now. Let's call upon our Lord as one congregation united in him. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit to earth, and, and we thank you for the revivals that have happened throughout history and in our own time. We ask that you would grant us a long-lasting, sturdy, stable faith so that we can bring glory and honor to your name now and for the rest of our lives here on earth. This we ask in the most holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart, let me be as gold. Purify
Let us pray for the church and for the world. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Archbishop Foley, Bishop Dan, Bishop Charlie, and all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Justin Trudeau, our Prime Minister, and Doug Ford, our Premier. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At this time, I would invite you to offer up intercessions of your own, and then I will lead us in further prayer. We come to you this week, Lord, in grief and sadness at the passing of our dear brother and friend, Canaan Brent Stiller of St. Peter and St. Paul's in Ottawa. In his life here on earth, Canaan Brent knew you and loved you and was just such an encouragement to many people throughout our diocese. Lord, at this time, we want to pray for all those who are experiencing grief at this tragic loss. We think especially of Brent's wife and kids and other relatives as well, and also his entire church family. We ask, Lord, that you would bring them comfort at this time and that you would help them to draw nearer to you. But Lord, in this time, we also thank you that we have this sure hope of the resurrection and life eternal. Lord, we thank you that, that we can face this loss knowing that Brent was received into your arms and that he will, in fact, live forever with all the saints. At this time, Lord, we also want to pray for all those who are struggling with grief because of the loss of a loved one. Lord, if, if that, in the case of those who don't know you, let this be an opportunity for them to explore the great questions of life and to consider the Christian faith. Lord, draw them closer to you by your Holy Spirit and help us to witness to them and to come alongside them in their difficult time. And for those who do know you, Lord, we ask that you would help them to reaffirm their faith even in the difficult times. Lord, we ask you as well that no matter what we're going through in our Lives, we who know you would be powerful witnesses for the gospel. Lord, help us to share the good news with everyone that we meet and to demonstrate the love that you have for them with our actions, not just our words. And Lord, all these things we ask with thanks for the grace that you give to each of us day by day and week by week. And once again, we pray as a congregation united in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen. Let's continue our service in the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the words of the prayer of thanksgiving, let's pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all of your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. 
Well, God bless you and have a wonderful week.